research that seeks to break the idea that crystals can only grow in a certain area of the stall map, which I have no idea that what that is, so it's good I'm here for the lecture. In dealing with zinc silicate to form, to form crystalline glazes, there is a wide area of possibilities for crystal growth that is not limited to low numbers of silica and alumina. And you know what I love so much about that description? That means every one of you in here is a bit of a nerd. <laughs> and that's just fabulous. So can we uh, put our hands together for my dear near friend, friend Christina Rhodes. Come on up. One quick thing. Would you turn off your cell phones? Thank you. OK, let it rip, baby. <laughs> uh, how does this sound, the mic? Um, hello, my name is Christina Rhodes, and I'm here to present my research on crystalline glazes. Over the past year, I have been recreating Artistol's glaze map with a focus on crystalline glaze style glazes. Um, there is a lot of websites and journal articles where the uh, recipes that are on there, they're very limited to like a very small corner of the still map. And I was talking to my professor, Matthew Katz, and uh, working with him throughout the past year um, based off some research he had previously done that indicated that there could be more possibility for growth, like it could go past that. So he told me that and I really ran with it while I was working with him at Alfred University and tried to figure out like what are the limits of crystal growth for crystalline glazes. I wanted to create a comprehensive exploration of the chemistry underlying crystalline glazes. Um, for, as an artist, I really wanted to explore and understand the variety of crystals that would be available to me. I figure out a way to handle the running off the pot problem. And fully delve into the phenomena that is crystalline glaze. For this research, I have decided to use R.T. Stoll's uh, map. Here is a newer version by Derek L. Um, most of the recipes and articles on this type of glaze say that crystalline glaze needs a unity molecular formula, or UMF, alumina level of 0.05 to 0.1 in order to grow crystals. This means that many crystalline glazes contain little to no clay, as clay is the most concentrated alumina source in glaze. Uh, this glaze right here is a perfect example. Um, it's uh, one I got offline, but it has all the basic ingredients for a zinc silicate based crystalline. Uh, if you notice that like um, the bentonite's a 0.6, the calcine kaolin's a 0.4, that makes the um, alumina, the, the clay level for the recipe to be only at 1%, which is ridiculously low. Um, some sources state that an alumina level higher than that will inhibit crystal growth and that either the low viscosity of the glass or the inherently low alumina level contributes to the ability for crystal growth. Um, this level of alumina is problematic because it makes the palette of possible glaze formulas limited because of the assumed chemical and material restrictions. And it causes a low viscosity glass to form which can cause massive running problems. That can really mess up the bottom of your pot. Personally, I believe it just creates a lot of unnecessary extra work for finishing a piece and some very sad artists. Oh, uh, they're saying no in the back. <laughs> uh, to solve this problem, I decided to create a large portion of the Stoll's map using the materials and the process of crystalline glazes. Stoll's map is based on the concepts of the UMF, wherein glaze chemistry is represented by the molecular proportion of oxides to fluxes in the glazes. The interesting thing about crystalline glazes is that they are composed of sodium and zinc, which can be substituted for potassium and calcium, which the map is based on. Sorry, water. Um, so knowing that typical crystalline glazes are found in this limited area, it's like tiny, I decided to branch out and explore a much wider range. I created formulas from alumina levels as low as 0.04 to 0.5 alumina to see if crystal growth is possible outside of what was originally thought. As I moved across the map with each row, I would increase the silica by 0.5 until I reached 5.0. And then I would do the same for whatever next level of alumina I was testing. Um, Here is a photo of me in the amazing glaze lab provided at Alfred University. 
Uh, to make my glazes, I use the ingredients silica, EPK, frit 3110, and zinc oxide. Um, these are the basic ingredients to form zinc silicate-based crystalline glazes. At 0.42, um, at 0.42 alumina and above, I began to use only 10% EPK, with the rest of the alumina coming from calcine kaolin, because the glazes were getting too thick from the high clay levels to really apply to the <laughs> tiles. Um, the batch sizes that I were making were 100 grams, and I used 32 grams of water for each test and sieved each before application to 100 mesh sieve. You guys really do need to sieve before you use zinc oxide just because zinc has the habit of settling if you don't, like, I can sieve it and then go to the coffee shop, grab a coffee, come back an hour and a half later, and it's all settled. It's really annoying. So sieve just before you spray or you brush or do whatever. Um, I applied my tiles by dipping them for three seconds, and the tiles were two by three porcelain. Um, this is actually a, one of the glazes if you guys wanted a recipe. Um, you can kind of see it's really close to the crazed region, so I would not suggest it for functional wear, maybe on the outside of a pot. Um, this particular glaze, the crystals are rather tiny, but on the tile, the, they're completely stable. They do not move. Um, I've no played around with colorants a little bit for this base glaze. As you add colorants, the crystals typically can grow like five times that size, but colorants can really mess around with the chemistry. So they may start moving a little bit if you start adding color to it. But as a base glaze, it does not move. And crystalline glazes can also be incredibly finicky. This is the same glaze uh, on the left is a three second dip, and on the right is a four and a half second dip. So the thicker the application, the larger the cluster of crystals, um, you're gonna get like a watery effect because they're all trying to grow on the same tile. Um, so if you want the perfect orb, just do a thinner application. I attempted to fire all the tiles in the same kiln to get a similar atmosphere and firing for a, a cohesive experiment. Uh, this is the kiln cycle here. Uh, it's in a medium electric kiln, so 270 per hour up to 2381. You hold there for 15 minutes, and then you crash cool to 1800 Fahrenheit. Uh, the internal temperature should go up to around 1971 naturally, just because uh, when you close the door, there's going to be internal heat built up, and it's just going to want to shoot back up. Um, typically, if it's under, you could just type in 9999 like as soon as possible for kiln language, and it'll go back up to that. Hold there for five hours and let it cool naturally. Uh, the crystal growth happens during the five-hour holding period. During this time, crystals are growing inside the glaze. The longer the hold, the larger the crystals. And um, the longer the cool cycle, um, you get like a lot of tiny crystals growing. And the temperature that it's held at can also affect like, what shape the glaze is. Um, I chose to do just the, the traditional shape because I was not playing around with like shape size or just shape. I was just wanting to explore the alumina levels. So uh, in Fahrenheit, it's 1922 to 2012 Fahrenheit for the traditional shape. And this is what it looks like on a tile. And the results of the tests were like amazing. The yellow is where like um, a lot of the articles and websites originally say that crystals can only grow in that specific area. And then the purple is the area in which I tested and actually found crystals growing. Um, exceeded the possible limits for alumina. I was able to get, um, cro ah, sorry, my water. I'm not good at public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was able to get crystal growth in glazes with alumin levels as high as 0.37, which is 3.7 times higher than what was originally thought possible. Um, most of the formulas have, well, most crystalline formulas have little to no clay. I was able to successfully make crystalline glazes with as much as 32% clay. Um, by increasing the alumina content, I am increasing my recipe's melting temperature. Alumina modifies the glass silica in the glaze so that it stiffens. A runny glaze is really just an overfired glaze. And alumina has, pure alumina, has a melting temperature of cone 42. 
So by adding clay or alumina, really, to your glaze, you're increasing the melting temperature and decreasing the running. Um, this is great because it means that artists can avoid going through so many different hoops trying to create the work that they want. Um, I haven't tried as many hoops. I know people have been throwing bowls and podiums and then cutting it off and grinding it. Uh, I don't have any photos of that, so I was just showing photos of my own struggle. It's annoying anyway. Um, it's like a lot of stress. Like you like put it in the kiln, you're like, how many hours do I have to grind? How many? How many? And I just prefer the easy way where I can walk away and know I can get up in the morning and not have to do anything to it. Uh, based off the results and the silica alumina zinc phase diagram that I made, um, I could tell that the willemite crystals start to transition into gonite after a 0.37 alumina level. Um, notice in the stole map below, the red line is where I'm testing and like kind of showing like what levels I'm jumping at. It's going uh, vertical. And in the next slide, I just want to make sure it's, you guys understand it's not this. This is going horizontal, it's moving right. So this transition phase is just it going into under fired mode. It's not what's happening on uh, the other slide. In the other slide, this is from willemite crystals to gonite crystals on the very right. Because um, gonite crystals are uh, zinc aluminate based. And if you look at it through an STEM machine, which is, you can, no, SEM machine, sorry, which you can find in a lot of the engineering departments, it's, um, it looks like a kind of star shaped versus willemite is uh, zinc silicate based and it looks more rod like. But going from willemite to gonite. I also learned that a um, 3.0 silica level is the typical limit for crystalline growth. So you can see um, silica is at the top. If you go down 3.0, it's like crystals typically start growing there. You can see it below 3.0. Um, there are, of course, a few outliers, um, I think. I can't really see the map on this one. I think it's at 3.5, so like I have one tile that's doing it. Yeah, at a 0.32 alumina. And then one tile, 0.42 alumina, 0.35 silica, there's another outlier. But typically, 3.0 is the cutoff for silica growing. It doesn't really want to grow past that. It's more willing before that. Um, at the intersection, this is at the intersection of 0.42 alumina and 4.0 alumina. It's the last individual crystals that I could see on its way to transition into gonite. It's just a mere dusting at the top, but it's completely stable. And the fact that it's like so high in like alumina and clay is just amazing that it exists. Uh, this is another tile I'm showing. It's like uh, these glazes have the same colorant in it. I think it's titanium dioxide. I cannot remember the percentage. But the one on the left has a higher alumina content than the one on the right. There is no running whatsoever on the one on the left. Uh, but the one on the right, I had to break just to get it off the thing I was firing it on. Unfortunately, though, whenever you do raise the alumina, you are making smaller crystals, but they are more reliable. And this shows um, the highest alumina level I got to, uh, 0.42 alumina, and the lowest alumina that I tested at, a 0.04 alumina. The 0.04 has no clay versus the 0.42 has 28.06 EPK. That's like an amazingly wide array of crystals that are available for artistic use. And I think this map also shows that it's like, I don't know, there's like a that's huge. There's so much exploration that could happen artistically. Like I haven't even really explored all the colorants with my own glazes yet. I chose like two or three base glazes, and that's what I've been testing for like a year now. So, yeah, there's just like a lot to discover. Yeah, this is amazing to me. I had to have it again. All right. <laughs> um, it's opportunities for artists to be able to create work with a stable glaze, less product loss, and sleep more peacefully at night, knowing that it'll come out okay. So you can see here in one of the pots I had, it's like a, just a purely clean line. Uh, yeah, it's just like, it's awesome. No running, no nothing. I think this is the glaze that I gave you the recipe for earlier, but with an addition of 2.2 uh, green nickel oxide. And the crystals did grow a lot larger whenever <laughs> you added the colorant. 
It might have moved slightly, but it didn't run off the pot, so yeah. I also think that with um, the crystal glaze getting more stable, there's more ability to play. Like with this cup here, um, you can like play with the foot, can give it like a nice waistband and gold. It's like you don't have to do it top to bottom with crystals just because you have to cut it off a podium. You can like make it in somewhere and make something else start. Really like play with layering things and just like making like really cool stuff. Uh, Okay, all right, I'm done ranting about glazes. I want to say thank you to Alfred University. My advisor is Matt Kelleher and Linda Sorman, and my professor, Matthew Katz, and his amazing class. Uh, it's Ceramic Materials Workshop. It's actually offered online if you guys are interested. So. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh yeah, um, these are far end of cone 10, almost cone 11. I think, uh, yeah, it goes up to 2381. Um, all of my research was on porcelain. However, for my personal work, I have put it on both stoneware and porcelain. Uh, some of them do not want to work at all on stoneware. Uh, some of them, they will work, but they come out a little bit different, like the colors will come out darker or just like weird. But um, all of my research is on porcelain, so I haven't really explored it with stoneware as thoroughly. I don't know too much about that. Um, my professor may know, we could talk to you within the class about it. I do know if it's really groggy, it may break up the glaze more and cause the crystals to grow less just because it's being broken up so much. But um, I don't know as much on that, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? Uh, I think the work that you've done is really important. Are you publishing a paper on your uh, research? Um, I've thought about it. I think the first step was just to get through this talk because I was kind of nervous for this. And uh, I'm graduating soon, so I kind of need to get through that too. There's a show to plan for, but maybe. <laughs> Will your uh, presentation be posted online? Uh, I believe it's going to be on the NSECA website. And if not, I believe they're also filming this, I think. Uh, somewhere, or that's the contract I signed. They may have, they may have not, but it, <laughs> um, it, it might possibly be on the Insigo website. Yes. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Katz uh, oh, gave a presentation it. yesterday about uh, uh, cone six versus cone ten and the stall charts. Uh, are you interested in pursuing uh, the study of crystalline glazes that? You're working with at cone 10 and 11, moving that down to cone 6, where some of us work. Um, I think that would be an interesting thing. It also help would it would help environmentally. Um, it's not the first thing. I, I do definitely want to run with the crystals, but it's not the first thing on my list to run into. Um, right now, I'm doing some tests um, using um, iron oxide as like a flux. So like, uh, yeah. I don't know, it's on the list of to-dos, but it's not like the next thing, sorry. The trick at cone six is out with the clay and in with the lithium. Oh. Uh, possibly, I don't know the answer though. I haven't tested any of that. <laughs> so I think I've read that um, 
either lithium or titanium can be used for seed seeding crystal growth and you were saying you use zinc yeah have you experimented at all with the other seed like or crystal manifestors? Um. Not using them as a base. Um, everywhere that I've read titanium, it's usually just used to help with the crystals. Like a, it'll act as like a seed planter, so like kind of just encouraging the growth. But it, titanium is not necessary for the growth. I didn't use titanium for any of my research. Um, I'm not sure about the other ingredient you listed, though. Yeah. Um, for, for the tiles, it was very clean, the bisque that I glazed on top of. Uh, for some of my work, I will admit I was in a hurry, uh, just because they were due rather quickly. I'm admitting that's my professor's, like, right there. But <laughs> uh, they were due rather quickly, so, like, some of the cups like this, I wasn't, like, necessarily nitpicking and making sure, like, every little thumbprint was gone. Um, yeah. But I do think, like, a, the from what I've noticed, I have put it on, like, texture pieces before, and, like, it does not like texture. It doesn't like being broken up that much. Um, so I think as little surface texture as possible will help with the crystal growth. Yeah. Just a quick comment. NSICA is not videotaping this presentation, but we do record the audio and the slideshow. And the way that we pick which of these presentations gets released first is by how many people go to the NSICA app and rate the presentation highly. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. Um, I just wanted to ask if you uh, knew of growing crystals on anything else. Like, I know some people have talked about molybdenum crystals, and you mentioned in your slideshow, I think, zinc silicate and zinc alumina. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any other suggestions for crystal growing? Um, I've only ever really tried zinc for my own personal use. Um, I know manganese based, you really get really cool metallic colors, so like bronzy, silvery looking ones. Um, but that base has like a habit of leaching and like it can kind of poison you if you drink out of it. But, um, I know there's a grad at my school who's doing some kind of research with a matte based crystalline. And I don't know if he's here now, but like, uh, yeah, I don't know too much about it outside of like zinc silicate crystals, but okay, there are other possibilities. Hi, um, have you used any other fruits besides 3110, like 413 or 644? Um, not for my personal research, but I was talking to a ceramic engineering grad at my school. Uh, his name is Max. I can't remember his last name, but like he was encouraging me to work with him in a lab and use other fruits. Um, I think if you use other fruits, because like they're just kind of like pre-made glazes, uh, it would change around the other ingredients that I use, just as far as like how much I'm adding in or like uh, what I'm adding in. Mm -hmm. But other fruits are possible to use for the glaze right, to thank make you. crystalline. Yeah, I've used uh, 644 and 413 th again, and they fire higher, but the results are different. But they're also they're pretty cool. Yeah. Huh. What cone? Um, about cone 11, cone 10. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Okay. I don't know how to end this if there are no more questions. I'm just standing here. <laughs>